Welcome students to this first video that specifically deals with the contents of the assignments for COM4809. Of course, if you are listening to this video, you are an organizational communication student. All right, so let's focus on what assignment one is all about. And essentially, assignment one is your big idea. You are going to explain to your supervisor what you want to do with your project of COM4809 this year. Now, of course, generally your topic has to deal with organizational communication satisfaction in an organization of your choice. But what you do with that really is up to you. You can decide what part of communication satisfaction you want to deal with, what the organization is that you chose to do this with, and of course, sort of what the bigger problem is within communication satisfaction that you want to solve in this research project of yours. Once you have uh, told us what you want to do with your topic, you will be assigned a supervisor. Okay, so let's have a look at what assignment one entails. Now, of course, you've had to read through your tutorial letter 101, so you have a general idea. And let's just talk about the aspects that we talk about over there. Now, assignment one, you will see, uh, tells you that three things will need to be done for the May deadline. And this is, first of all, that you will have to identify a research problem that deals with communication satisfaction among employees of an organization of your choice. Now, this part of the assignment will have to contain a questionnaire that talks about all of the sort of nitty gritty aspects of your study. Then, lastly, you will have to complete a literature review of your topic. Okay, so generally there are three things that you will focus on in this first assignment. Now, just so, this video will focus on the three separate things that we expect you to comply to. Now, firstly, you will identify this research problem, and this will be the first part of your assignment one demarcating your research topic. After that, you will complete a literature review, and this will be the second part of your assignment. Now, assignment one is in a way a sort of uh, mixing together of two separate assignments. Why do I say so? Well, your demarcation of your research topic should almost be a assignment on its own. And what I mean by that is, that part, the first part of your assignment, needs to have an introduction, a, uh, a body, a conclusion, and a list of sources consulted that's particular to that first part. Then, in between the first part and the second part, you will have the questionnaire. Now, this questionnaire can be found as Addendum A to your Tutorial Letter 101, but it's also under Additional Resources on My UNISA under the Organizational Communication folder. So, you have Part 1, which is an assignment all on its own almost. Then you have a questionnaire. And then you have Part 2, the Literature Review, which is also an assignment all on its own. It will have its own introduction, its own body, its own conclusion, and its own list of sources consulted. Now, the reason why we focus on having uh, these sort of separate sections in this assignment is because, as you will see in the video on a bird's eye view of the, of the module, this first assignment will be chapter one and chapter two of your final portfolio. So, part one will become chapter one, part two will become chapter two. In this video, we're going to talk about part one and the questionnaire in just a moment. Then we're going to have a small little intermission where you can pause the video if you want to, to go grab a cup of coffee or to just take a breath and stretch your legs. And then we will focus on the literature review on its own. Now, before we look at all of the aspects of part one and the questionnaire in detail, Let's just quickly have a look at the general aspects of the assignment and of all of the assignments that you will have to complete for COM4809 as well. First of all, all of your assignments in COM4809 will have to be submitted to MyUNISA as a PDF. You have to be able to PDF 
your Word documents. And if you don't know how to do that, just come into contact with me via email and I'll send you a quick little video on how to do that. But mostly it's just a matter of saving it as a PDF once you are done with your assignment completely. Now, of course, make sure that you are familiar with the self-scan steps of for plagiarism detectim, detection, which is the Turn It In program, and that you've followed all of the correct submission procedures. I can't stress this enough. In Tutorial Letter 101, we tell you that we will penalize you if you don't follow the correct steps in terms of turn it in and we mean it many students are very sort of flabbergasted at the fact that we do penalize just as we say we will you can take us at our word in this module we do what we say we will do then you can start your work on your research ethics approval form which we mention in uh, tutorial letter 101 and which is also a discussion topic forum on my UNISA but this will only need to be handed in once your topic has been narrowed down and your supervisor has been assigned uh, for COM4809. Now we suggest that you limit assignment one to a maximum of 25 pages excluding your list of sources consulted for the respective parts and I know this might seem like very little but unfortunately, your portfolio in the end can't be over too many pages. So we need to limit the assignments already so that you don't end up in trouble once you put your portfolio together. So if I were you, I would keep part one of my uh, assignment one to 10 pages and then part two to 15 pages. Now, this, of course, excludes the table of contents. It excludes the declaration. It excludes the list of sources consulted. So that's just the content parts of these two parts of the assignment. Then, as soon as you have handed in your first assignment, you will be assigned a supervisor and I will send each and every one of you a personalized email wherein the contact details of your supervisor is stipulated. If you don't hand in assignment one, you don't get a supervisor. So it's very important that you hand in assignment one on the due date. If you don't hand in by the due date, you don't get a supervisor and I'm unable to assign one to you. So make sure that you, that you actually submit this first assignment on the due date in order to get somebody from our lecturing team who will act as your supervisor throughout the rest of the year. All right, so before we start with the particulars of part one of this assignment, just make sure that you have actually watched all of the videos that we talk about in my class schedule that I posted up to my UNISA. There's an announcement about it and it's also available under the additional resources tab. This might be where you got the link for this video in the first place, but be very um, sure that you have watched the aspect regarding how to get use of, how to get hold of sources making use of Google Scholar and the UNISA library. Now the reason why this is very important is twofold. First of all, there's many concepts in this module that you will have to read up on. For example, if we say what is a longitudinal study, what is a cross-sectional study, what is a quantitative study, what is a qualitative study, what are the components of an interview, what are the aspects that you need to keep in mind for a questionnaire, etc., etc., you actually have to read up on all of those aspects in order to answer to them in this first assignment. Of course, for COM4809, you don't have a prescribed textbook. So it's really important to really make it your priority to search for sources that um, explain and explicate the aspects that we want you to elaborate on. The second reason why it's important to be able to find and source your own sources is because the literature review, which is of course part two of this assignment, focuses in on that. And you can't complete a literature review without reviewing the literature sources. So, of course, it's very important that you watch that video. The other video that's also very important is the bird's eye view video, uh, which I've already referred to. And the reason for this is that it gives you a general overview of where all of the assignments actually are headed. So, as I said, assignment one actually becomes chapter one and two of your portfolio. So, in order to keep that general and overview of where this is all headed and, and the bigger picture of where it all fits into a study as a whole, you will have to watch that video before you continue on with this video. Okay, 
with all of that said and done, let's have a look at part one of your assignment, the big idea part. And let's focus in right at the beginning to the demarcating of your research topic. Now, on the first page of your assignment, you do all the usual things, right? You include the information as required, a title, a declaration, table of contents, etc. But specifically for part two, the demarcation of your topic, it's important to have an introduction. It's important to contextualize the problem and the background of your study. Then to give statements of the problem, its sub-problems and objectives. Then have a conclusion and then a list of sources consulted. So all of these aspects, these five aspects, need to feature in this part two of demarcating your research topic. Let's have a look at each one of them specifically, starting with the introduction. Firstly, you need to understand that an introduction introduces the assignment, as the name implies. It is the first thing that your reader encounters and should therefore give him or her a sense of what is to follow. In this, you cannot only focus on blatantly telling the reader or readers what you will discuss in your assignment, but you also need to orientate them in terms of the topic and focus of your assignment. Therefore, you may want to include some thoughts on communication satisfaction and related concepts and briefly give some insights into the organization that you will use in your study and the aspect of communication satisfaction that you want to explore within that organization. Then, formulate the specific statement regarding your research problem tersely, but in prose, which means in sentences. Now, I make a suggestion to all of my postgraduate students, including M's and D's, that you read the introductions of academic communication texts, such as articles, and see what is done there. Much the same is expected of you at this level. And a good starting point, I might suggest, is the academic journal Communicatio, which is published in our department. Now, if you don't know how to get hold of Communicatio, please watch the first video that I refer to, the one that shows you how to make use of Google Scholar and the UNISA library in conjunction to get hold of the articles that you want. Now, a good tip that I might lastly just add on an introduction is that I always write my introductions right after I've done everything else for my assignment, because then I have a better view of what I did in my assignment, so I'm better equipped to tell my reader what to expect from it as well. Next, let's have a look at contextualization of the problem or the background of your study. Now, in this part of the uh, assignment, you will have to explain why, why the aspect that you will address is a problem, situating it specifically within the organization that you are doing your research at, within organizational communication in general, and more specifically, within the context of communication satisfaction. These two aspects are of the utmost importance because students sometimes get so lost in their assignment that they forget where the focus truly needs to lie. Now, a very important aspect that I need to tell you about the contextualization of the problem of your research is that you should be careful not to make use of anecdotal evidence. Many of you will be choosing the organization that you already work at in order to do your research or you know a lot about the organization and therefore chose it. Now, what you need to guard against is not making use of anecdotal evidence, evidence that you shouldn't really already know about if you are an objective researcher. Okay, so for example, always remember, right at the beginning of your study, right at the beginning of your research, you don't really already know everything that you will be researching. So don't write in that manner. Don't, for example, say communication satisfaction is a problem in this organization because you don't know that yet. You still have to research that in order to make such claims. Don't rely on anecdotal evidence to contextualize the problem of communication satisfaction in that organization. Once you have contextualized to the reader what to expect in terms of your um, research problem, you then have to go ahead and articulate the statement of the problem, sub-problems, and objectives. And this is where 
uh, the problem usually comes in because there's a confusion among students of the difference between the statement of the problem, the research statement, the problem statement, the sub-problems, objectives, etc. So let's take a moment and really focus in on this, making sure that we understand all of the differences. So the problem statement is the bigger picture of what you want to do in your research. What the problem is that you intend your research in this project to answer to. Your sub-problems, as the name suggests, tells your reader how you intend to answer to the main research problems, what the smallest steps are in solving it. Lastly, your ob objectives point to what your intentions are in terms of the problem that you want to address. Now let's look at each of these closer with a nice easy example. If I asked you, where do you want to go on holiday? And you told me, I want to go to Cape Town. That would be your general idea of where you want to go. The bigger idea of where you want to end up. And that is very like your problem statement. Now, between Joburg and Cape Town, for example, there's a lot of steps that has to happen. You would, for, for example, stop in Kroenstadt, Bloemfontein, Beaufort West, or wherever in order to get to Cape Town. Now, although Cape Town is your target, there are smaller targets on your way there so that lead you to your main objective. And this is exactly how it works in research as well. So, let's say my main aim, where I want to end up, my research problem that I want to solve, is the use of different communication channels by supervisors at ABC organization to convey task-specific messages to subordinates and their perceived communication satisfaction with that task. So that's my general idea. That's where I want to end up. Now, let's break that down. This general idea has steps or puzzle pieces that piece together this bigger idea. The first one might be the use of different communication channels by supervisors, at this organization, in order to convey task-specific messages, to subordinates, and then these subordinates' perceived communication satisfaction with it. So as you can see, smaller puzzle pieces piece together this general idea. So when I start to formulate my research problem or my problem statement and sub-problems, I start out with this general idea, this big puzzle piece. Then I start to extract the smaller pieces of the puzzle that make up this general idea. The first puzzle piece might have to do with the, the channels that the supervisors have access to. So I might ask the question, what communication channels are available to supervisors at ABC organization? My next puzzle piece might be, what are the task-specific messages that need to be conveyed at this organization? Then I might ask, what is subordinates' level of satisfaction with the communication channels at this organization? And I might also ask, what are supervisors' satisfaction with the communication channels at ABC? Now, very important to note here is that each one of these puzzle pieces work in conjunction with one another to answer the bigger research problem. Just like the smaller pieces of a puzzle fit together to give you the general picture that emerges once they are together. Now, for COM4809, we tell you that you need to do interviews and questionnaires. So when you start to extract the puzzle pieces, the sub-problems of this bigger problem statement, you will have to choose those that can be answered through interviews and questionnaires. And then you select two to four sub-problems that deals with your main problem and that can be answered by the data that you will gather from your interviews and your questionnaires. So now that we have a general idea of what those sub-problems and, and the general research ideas should look like, we should always remember that none of these should have a yes or no answer. You shouldn't ask questions like, 
are employees satisfied with communication? Because your answer can always just be yes or no. And we don't want that. We want questions that we can expand on in terms of its answer and show off the research that we did. Okay, so let's move on to the actual research problem statement. Now, what we looked at previously, this bigger picture that we built with our puzzle pieces, which were the sub-problems, was our general research idea. Now, formulating a sound research problem statement is a little bit more complex than just writing down your general research idea. Specifically, we have to focus on five things. This problem statement needs to be a complete, grammatically correct sentence, a single sentence. It should indicate the time frame in which your study should be done. Now, a time frame, of course, is either longitudinal or cross-sectional. And for COM4809, your research would be cross-sectional. Now, it's up to you to go read up on that and see why I say so. Then, directly related to communication satisfaction among employees in a specific organization, because that is the focus of COM4809. It should include, include major concepts which are supported by a theoretical framework. And this is why we want you to read so much before you do your assignment one. For example, the general idea that we just had had to do with communication channels. And if you read up on communication satisfaction literature, you're going to see that one of the dimensions of communication satisfaction is media quality. And media quality has to do with communication channels. So that might be something that I want to really focus on in my research. But in order to know that, I would have had to do my reading first. And if I did my reading, it will be a piece of cake to include major concepts which are supported by this theoretical framework that I'd, I had undergone through my reading. Lastly, your research, research, research problem statement should indicate the method to be used in collecting data. So taking my general research idea that we just had a look at and restructuring it according to these points, my research problem statement might, and this is really just an example to prove my point, look something like this. A cross-sectional qualitative and quantitative exploration of the communication satisfaction of supervisors at ABC organization with the media quality of task-specific channels. Again, this is just an example. You should have your own idea of what your research should focus on. Please do not <laughs> copy this example here. Now, when you look at this research problem statement, you're going to see one last thing that we need to talk about, and that is the objective of my research. My objective here is to explore. There are three kinds of objectives in research as we define it, and these are either to explore, describe, or explain, or a combination of any of the three. Now, there are many sources that you can have a look at in order to really um, understand what the objectives of research are. But I still like to go back to a source that we prescribe for undergraduate students here at Tunisia, which is Duplue. Now, Duplue gives a good idea of these three objectives, and you can go and have a look at that. Um, always make sure to supplement your reading with more advanced sources that are applicable to postgraduate level. But to get your first general understanding of the objectives, you can have a look at that source. Okay, so now that we've had a chat about that, it doesn't seem so hard, does it? First of all, we've already had a look at the main research problem, whether you call it a research problem, a research statement, a problem statement, or whatever, the main research problem is as we just talked about. Then we have sub-problems that answer to the main problem. It's the main research problem basically segmented into the puzzle pieces that gives us the general idea. And lastly, we had to talk about the objectives. And that's all there is to it. Really not so hard. Okay, now let's have a look at the questionnaire which will come between the first part of assignment one and the second part of assignment one.
Now, I know that this questionnaire seems like a sort of add-on because it is a little bit different to the first and second part of the assignment. And it's sort of uh, in between, quite literally, uh, of the two important aspects. However, I have to have to ask one thing of you. Do your due diligence when it comes to this part of the assignment. It might seem like the last piece and you're not going to really put too much work into it. But remember, this part of your um of your assignment one will really help you with all of the chapters and assignments to follow. So doing the work now while you have the time is really something you will thank yourself for later on. Now, as I said before, the questionnaire is right at the end of tutorial letter 101 as an addendum, but it's also uploaded on my UNISA under additional resources. So you can have a look at the Word version of the questionnaire over there. Now, filling out the questionnaire might seem like a straightforward thing, and it can be. I must, however, tell you two important things to take note of. Firstly, a general aspect that you must take note of, and this is something that we mentioned in Tutorial Letter 101, and I've discussed on my UNISA, you must have a minimum of 30 respondents for your questionnaire. If you want to include fewer than this number, you will have to request permission and to do so, give reasons to support your request. Why 30 respondents, you might ask? Well, for the empirical part of the study, the actual data gathering by means of the questionnaire, you will have to extract quantitative findings in the form of statistical analysis. For basic statistical analysis, for example, frequency tables, you need at least 30 respondents to justify the analysis. If you only have three employees or three respondents, for example, it's rather pointless to state that 33.3% of respondents are male and 66.6% .6 were female or something to that effect when you have two males and one female. That really doesn't make sense. So have 30 respondents because that justifies the quantitative analysis that you will do. Therefore, we recommend to students to choose an organization with at least 50 employees if you can, taking into account that not all might want to take part in your study and some might be absent when you administer it, etc. Now, the second aspect that I want to discuss is very important. Do not think that because this is a questionnaire, you can answer it in telegram style. For example, this is not the way to go about answering the questionnaire. If you are asked about your accessible population, you will still have to treat the answer like an academic response. For example, in this way. First, you give a little bit of an explanation what the aspect that the questionnaire asks of is, and then you elaborate on how it comes into play in your research specifically. So again, no telegram style. Really discuss the aspects in the questionnaire like you would any other academic text. Okay, so that's it for sort of the first part of your assignment one. Let's, before we move on to the second part, take a little intermission if you want to. Now you can pause your video over here and go make a cup of coffee, stretch your legs, just get your bearings right because the second part of this video is actually uh, 40 minutes long. So you will have to sort of catch your breath before we move on to that and sort of switch your mind over to now not the demarcation of your research topic but to the literature review of your study. Now, I know most of you have already started your reading, your subject-specific reading in earnest, but today we're going to talk about the nitty-gritty in terms of a literature review. So, let's jump right in. First of all, let's talk about why one does a literature review in any kind of research. Well, first of all, the researcher must learn from previous theory on the subject. You must be able to comment on how your subject has been studied previously. And in terms of COM4809, obviously that is communication satisfaction. Further to this, you also have to show that your work is adding to the understanding of the knowledge within the field. Already at honors levels, 
you should be able to tell how your study contributes and adds to, supplements, the communication satisfaction literature. Very importantly, however, a literature review is done because you are contextualizing your study within your field. And the best way to sort of think about this is to imagine your study and the specific research that you're going to be doing as a seed. Then think about literature as soil. Now, in order for a seed to grow and prosper into something worthwhile, it has to be put into the soil. So you're contextualizing your study in terms of the greater discipline in order for your study to grow within that discipline. Lastly, you are also showing that you have done your scientific due diligence. The aspects that you comment on, that you discuss, and that you eventually put over to findings aren't just thumb sucked. They come from the specific scientific research already done within the subject area. So that's broadly why we do a literature review. So now that we understand why we do it, where does one really start when it comes to a literature review? Well, in terms of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the three main phases of a literature review. The first phase is reading, reading, reading. And I can't overemphasize this. The reading part of a literature review is arguably the most important part of it altogether. But it takes a lot of time, a lot more time than you might think. And because you're reading, you don't necessarily have something to show for it. So it feels as if it's a tedious task that just never ends. However tedious it might be, it is extremely important for your study. As examiners and as lecturers, it's very easy to see right off the bat when a student has done their due diligence in terms of reading and when they have not. You can't really fake that aspect of a study. You either did your reading and you have a deep theoretical understanding or you don't. So the first phase of a literature review is really just to read, read, and read some more. The second phase is where you collaborate what you've already learned, you integrate it in terms of your sources and in terms of your own study, and then you summarize everything that you read. Lastly, you write up your literature review. Now, please note over here that the writing part comes after the reading and the collaborating, integrating, and summarizing part. So don't start writing before you really have done the first two steps. Now, in terms of this, let's have a look at what the read, read, read phase of a literature review entails. Now, literature review starts off very broadly. You do research into communication satisfaction, for example, and you read everything that you can find on it. So your reading starts out very broadly, and then it becomes more and more and more specific as you focus in on the aspects that are applicable specifically to your study. Now, you can't know what the specific aspects are that are going to be applicable to your study until you've done the broad reading. So, always in an academic situation, we say you start by reading undiscriminately. You read everything that you can find on the topic and you don't focus in too much. That only comes in later when you start to become more specific in your reading. Now an example in terms of COM4809, as I've just said, is that you would start out with the broader and start out by reading everything that you can find on all communication satisfaction literature. As your reading progresses, you might see, ah, hold on, in terms of my study and in terms of the research that I want to do, Downs and Hazen, who is a seminal um, source in communication satisfaction literature, really does focus on the aspects that I want to focus on. So from your broad communication satisfaction literature reading, you might narrow your reading a little bit more to those aspects that Downs and Hazen focused on or on the sources that comment on Downs and Hazen.
Then you might say, but within the eight dimensions of communication satisfaction that Downs and Hazen um, purport, personal feedback really is what I should be focusing on in terms of the research that I want to do. And then you start your reading to focus only on those sources that deal with personal feedback. So you can see how your reading would progress from the broad to the very specific. But you have to do a lot of reading to know what the specific thing is that you want to get through. Okay, so what should you be reading? Well, first of all, you should select only academic literature. And if you have a problem with getting hold of or selecting academic literature, look at the video that I posted at the beginning of the year about using Google Scholar and the UNISA library. Then you should be reading to build a theoretical foundation. So you should be focusing on those aspects that give a foundation to your research specifically. You should be reading recent articles. Those are articles published between 2005 and now, so between 10 to 11 years, unless they are seminal works. Now, seminal works, of course, are, for example, those works by Downs and Hazen that really are the seminal literature within the field. When there are seminal works, you can date back as far as you want to, but all other literature should not be more than 10 years old. You should also be exhaustive in terms of your reading. And this is a very important aspect that ties in with the fact that you will be reading broadly and right down to specifically. If you are exhaustive in your reading, this means that you have read everything that is absolutely necessary for you to read in order to construct a good literature review. Now, of course, it's not possible to read absolutely everything ever written on the topic, but it is very much possible to read until the point of theoretical saturation. Now, the point of theoretical saturation is when you reach a point where no new information is gleaned from new sources, which means everything that you read only just repeats what you've already learned. You've reached theoretical saturation. So read and read and read until the point of theoretical saturation. That's how you know you are exhaustive in terms of your reading. Also, very important, when you start out in terms of your broader reading, you need to scan your documents because you won't be able to read absolutely everything in earnest. So a quick little tip that I always offer my students is read the abstract of um, articles and read the conclusion because in the abstract and in the conclusion the most pertinent aspects of that article will be highlighted and you'll be able to glean from that whether or not this article is something that you want to go ahead and read from the beginning to the end. Only if you find something that is applicable, or interesting or um, noteworthy in the abstract and in the conclusion do you go then and read the whole article from cover to cover. Also, another tip that I always offer students is that you have to record your references as you read, just because I know from experience that although you think you're going to remember where, the, where your sources come from, you honestly don't always. So just have, it doesn't have to be a complete or a 100% correct uh, reference list, just make sure that somewhere you keep tabs on what you're reading and what information comes from which source. Lastly, be sure to make notes. If you read, you think you're going to remember everything that you picked up on, but nobody does. Because you're going to be reading so much, you're going to be forgetting what you read right at the beginning of your broader reading. And it might be something that becomes important to your study. So, you can uh, make notes however you want to, but I'll quickly show you how I make notes. Also, just to show you that we practice what we, pre what we preach. And here is how I make notes. So I print out my articles and I highlight them. And right at the top, I remind myself what the theory is. This is contingency theory. And what are the main things that the article that I'm uh, 
looking at at that moment focuses on. So it's critique or it's background to the study or whatever. Point is, I make some notes along the way. All right, so that's in terms of phase one, the reading, reading, reading. Now let's quickly look at three points that you should not do, things to avoid. First of all, you have to avoid long quotations in your literature review because direct quotes should always be kept to a minimum. So although when you are reading, 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 you will be keeping tabs on good quotations, just the whole time while you are reading, remember that these long quotations should never make it into the final draft of your literature review. That's because you're going to be interpreting what you've read but a little bit more about this later on. You should never provide insignificant information just to make up pages. Rather elaborate on the relevant points in terms of a literature review. Lastly, using only one or two authors in the same section is to be avoided. This shows that you haven't really searched enough for enough sources and your reading and theoretical depth is not where it should be. If you read as much as you should in this first phase of your literature review, you will have more than one source to integrate in all of the sections that you present. And we'll talk a little bit more about integrating sources a little bit later on, but this is something that you need to keep in mind in this first phase of your literature review. Good, now that's reading done. Let's look at the second phase of your literature review. And the second phase is the collaboration, integration, and summarization phase. In this phase, it's very important to see the links in your literature review with the rest of your study. In Tutorial Letter 101, we tell you that Assignment 3 is extremely important to the whole project because the methodology, the measuring instruments in particular, and the empirical part of the study are dependent on a solid literature review. So let's look at why we say that. Well, I made you a little bit of a graphic to show you how a literature review is embedded into each and every part of your study. Let's look at all of these aspects one at a time. Okay, so let's zoom in on this model over here and look at each part of it specifically. First of all, you will see from literature, you glean theoretical statements from the theories and models and general literature that you consulted. Your theoretical statement then gives way to concepts, abstract latent variables that you will be investigating in your study. Now, these latent variables or concepts are made up of smaller latent variables that are measurable and these are known as constructs. Now these constructs are the variables that you will be testing in the empirical part of your study. Of course these constructs have to be measured in terms of the empirical measuring instruments, in your case questionnaires and interviews, and these measurements give way to answering the research questions or sub-problems that you formulated. And all of these together, of course, answers your main research problem. So let's look at that again, but this time let's make it applicable with a relevant example. So let's start right at the top and we say, from literature, we are focusing on communication satisfaction in COM4809. Communication satisfaction, we might lean with our reading, has have a whole bunch of different concepts. According to Downs and Hazen, just to refer back to the example I used earlier, again, you don't have to use Downs and Hazen, this is just the example that I use. Downs and Hazen has eight concepts. They define them as the eight dimensions of communication satisfaction. Now, the first three of those eight dimensions are, for example, horizontal and informal communication, superior and subordinate communication, and communication climate. Now, from my reading, I gleaned all of these concepts. 
But I might decide when I look at my organization, the most important things to focus on is the first two of those concepts. So in my study, I might decide I want to focus on horizontal informal communication, superior and subordinate communication. So I might not even look at the other concepts. Then when I look at my two concepts that I choose, I would do a little bit further reading and see that they have various constructs. And horizontal and informal communication might have the constructs of horizontal communication as one, informal communication as the other, and the grapevine within the communication landscape as the last one. Again, these are just examples. When I did my reading on superior and subordinate communication, I might see that superior and subordinate communication is made up of issuing information, personalized feedback, and leadership. So when I'm done with my reading at this point, I can see that the variables that I will be focusing on in my study are horizontal communication, informal communication, the grapevine, issuing information, personalized feedback, and leadership. Now I have to decide how am I going to measure that within my organization. And I might see the best way to do so is to make use of a questionnaire for the first construct, concept, combination, and interviews for the second construct, concept, combination. So if I make use of a questionnaire for those three variables or constructs that I have, I would have questions or items within my questionnaire about horizontal communication, about informal communication, and about the grapevine. Then, when I draw up my interview schedule, I will ask questions about issuing information, about personalized feedback, and about leadership. At this point, you can see how the measuring instruments are gleaned from the literature because I won't know what to ask or how to ask it until I haven't done my reading. Now, of course, the data from the questionnaire and the interviews will move on to answer my research questions, and my research questions will eventually lead through to answering my research problem. And that's how your literature review just permeates through into every aspect of the research process. Now let's move a little bit forward and look at the last part of the literature review process. And we're going to be talking about everything that we also saw in the second phase, which is integrating and summarizing. Okay, in terms of writing up your literature review, there's a few things that I want us to focus on. And the three main aspects that I really want to zoom in on is, first of all, integrating sources which we already touched upon previously, making the theory applicable to your study and line of argumentation. So let's focus in on the first one over here, integrating sources. Integration of sources is taking two or more sources together when you make your point or make your discussions in your literature review. Now, let's have a look at some examples. Okay, so in this little short paragraph that we have over here, we see so great is this impact that the DME can shut down operations whenever the safety of an organization is less than satisfactory. And then the reference over there. This influence is a motivation for safety communication at the Gautrain project to strive for excellence as the organization's survival is directly dependent thereon. Rhodes and Barker reverberates the sentiment by noting the fact that the political environment, blah, 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 blah. So we have an integration of sources over here because we have the first source over here and then the second source over here. And we link or integrate these sources through what we say. And what we say over here is that Rhodes and Barker reverberates the sentiment as displayed in Machiara. Okay, so that's one way to integrate sources. The other way to integrate sources, and I'm sure you've come across this various times in your reading, is where you have a sentiment that is displayed by more than one source together. And when all of these sources say the same thing, we then reference that thought to all of them. We separate the sources out 
by a semicolon. So this source reference says that I read a lot and through all of my reading I can say that Grunig, Downs and Lindeborg all said this thing that I am discussing over here. Okay, so that's integrating sources. Let's now look at making the theory applicable to your study. Now, you cannot just regurgitate what is already stated in theory, in literature, because nobody really wants to see a literature review that's just a summary of everything that you've read. If a, an examiner wants to read the literature, they'll read the original literature. They don't just want a summary from you. What they want from you is applying an application of the theory to your research specifically. You have to say how everything that you read and that you are commenting on in your literature review is applicable or important to note in terms of your research context specifically. So let's look at a couple of examples again. So again, we have a paragraph over here. As communication has to cope with these turbulent environments, they are excelled towards making use of strategic and sophisticated two-way communications. Safety communication at the Gautrain project is therefore excelled by the level of activism in its environment to become strategic and two-way. So, as you can see, the first sentence over there is from literature. Literature tells me that communication has to cope with turbulent environments. I then make that applicable to my study in this way. The source reference can either come at the end of my application or where I state the theory. In my case, I decided to do right at the end because the application wasn't my idea either. It also came from the references. Although the references didn't state it pertinently, my application is born from the notions displayed therein. Another example is this one. The infrastructure of the environment that an organization subsists in is made up of that environment's economic development, its political system, as well as the level of activism found therein. Although all three variables impact on the way in which the organization is run, the latter two concepts specifically have a great impact on the communication of safety information. So as you can see, this last sentence over here really takes what the theory said and makes it applicable to this study specifically, which focused on the communication of safety information. Now, of course, you would have to motivate all of the aspects that you mentioned, but as you can see, here I am applying the theory that I get to my study specifically. So that's how it relates back to making the theory applicable to your study. And you have to make all theoretical aspects, each and every section in your literature review, applicable to your study specifically. Lastly, let's have a look at line of argumentation. And in terms of line of argumentation, let's look at paragraph progression. So let's start off by thinking what a paragraph is. A paragraph is a collection of related sentences dealing with a single topic. Now, through your paragraphs, you progress a single, uninterrupted, coherent argument, an academic argument that is pushed forward paragraph by paragraph by paragraph. You should never have a list of facts in your literature review. You should have a coherent discussion. It's very important to note. So let's stand still on that for just a second and we look these paragraphs. First of all, I want us to talk about adequate development, then unity, and then coherence. Okay, let's focus on adequate development. The topic that the paragraph, each and every paragraph, deals with should be discussed and fully and adequately in the paragraph unpacked. What this means is that you should focus on unpacking the topic that's under investigation in that paragraph completely before moving on to another. Now it goes on to say there, this varies from paragraph to paragraph depending on the author's purpose, but writers should be aware of paragraphs that have only one or two 
or three sentences. This is a pretty good bet that the paragraph is not fully developed if it is short. So there should be adequate development in a paragraph. You should really unpack everything in terms of that topic in the paragraph first before you move on to a next or to a further elaboration on that topic. Secondly, all paragraphs should also have unity. Now, the entire paragraph should concern itself with a single focus. If it begins with one focus or ma major point of discussion, it should not end with another point of discussion. It should not wander between ideas within the paragraph. One paragraph, one idea. Lastly, there should be coherence in your paragraph. Coherence is that golden thread or logical line of argumentation that runs through your writing. It's very hard to build in coherence in your writing right at the beginning, but there's two ways to further or to better your coherence. The first thing is you have to read a lot of academic texts. The best way to learn how to write is to read. There's no shortcut there. However, there is a bit of a cheat way. And when you really just start out with writing academically, I always tell my students to make use of transitional expressions. And the reason for this is transitional expressions force you to build in coherence because it forces you to think how one sentence relates to the next and how one paragraph relates to the next. So let's look at some examples of transitional expressions. Okay, so transitional expressions are employed for different reasons. First, you can employ transitional expressions to show addition. So the transitional expressions that you might use are again, also, and then, besides, equally important, etc., etc. So you might have one topic that says the environment of an organization is important, and then you might say, Equally important is also to show coherence between your first thought and your second thought. You might also compare, so you would use transitional expressions like also, in comparison, in the same way, likewise, similarly. Then you might give examples or uh, uh, intensify the thought that you've uh, been going on about. And you might use transitional expressions like after all, as an illustration, certainly, even, for example, for instance, etc. Then you might need transitional expressions to summarize, repeat, or conclude. And then you make use of transitional expressions like all in all, all together, as a result, as had been noted, in particular, in short, etc., etc. Then you indicate place, not only physical place, but discussional place in saying above, adjacent to, below, further on, on the other side, on the other hand, etc. And then lastly, you might want to indicate cause and effect, and you might say, accordingly, as a result, because, consequently, for this purpose, etc., etc. So transitional expressions are a good way to help you start off by being coherent if you aren't already in your writing. Okay, so paragraphs have to show adequate development, unity, and coherence. Let's move on now to look at the last aspect of writing up your literature review. And let's focus on answering the question about structure. Now, if you look at Tutorial Letter 101, you're going to see that we give you a few ideas around how a literature review is usually structured. You can structure it according to chronological order, from the general to the specific, contrast comparison, trend identification, methodological focus, problem cause solution, or topical order. Now, although any of these might be uh, potentially suitable, the first two and the last one is used most often in studies at honors level. The chronological order from general to specific or topical order. Let's look at examples of these kinds of structures. Here we have an example of a literature review on communication satisfaction. Now, this literature review is ordered in a multiple of ways. First of all, it's ordered chronologically. 
As you can see, this liter literature review starts off by showing where communication satisfaction came from, and it traces its roots back to the late 1960s and the work of Likert. Now, Likert thought that communication satisfaction was unidimensional, which means one dimension to communication satisfaction. You are either satisfied or unsatisfied. There's one dimension to communication satisfaction. And that's where communication satisfaction started. It progressed, however, until what is what we know of it today. And for example, Downs and Hazen thought, wait, 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 communication satisfaction is not unidimensional, it's multidimensional and has eight factors. So as you can see, it progressed its discussion from the late 1960s through to the 1970s and beyond. So that's one way in which communication satisfaction literature could be ordered chronologically. The next way in which communication satisfaction can be ordered is to have it from the general to the specific. Now, the general to the specific is called deductive reasoning patterns or deductive writing patterns. And it is a pattern that you are would do good to employ in terms of your writing in general. So this literature review is also a little bit deductive in its reasoning pattern because it starts off with, with discussing communication satisfaction in its general terms and then it moves on to discuss the dimensions of communication satisfaction, making it from the broad to a little bit more specific and then it goes even further into in terms of specifics and discusses each one of the dimensions on their own. So it moves from a broad discussion of communication satisfaction to the eight dimensions in general and to each one of the dimensions specifically. A last possible way in which this literature review could have been ordered is by clustering together the different topics within communication satisfaction. Now, let's say, for example, I decided that my communication constructs, as with the graphic that we looked at earlier, is horizontal and informal communication, as well as subordinate and superior communication. I could cluster those together and discuss them uh, together. That would be a topical cluster, which would be a topical ordering of my literature review. Okay, so although any one of those could be appropriate, chronological, from the general to the specific, and topical order are the ones used most often at this level of academic study. Okay, so that's a general overview of a literature review. Uh, I hope that this video helped you out. And start with your reading early. It really does take up more time than you think, but as you progress on it, it will become all the more fun, I promise you. All the best.